From our studios in Princeton, New Jersey, here's what we're sharing on today's Writers to Writers. We'll share a how-to guide when writing for ghosts, witches, and other paranormal beings. Also, what you need to know about outlining before you write your next manuscript. And you may want to rethink your query letter after hearing from today's literary agent. It's all coming up right now. Hello and welcome to Writers to Writers. I'm Jennifer Sneed. And I'm Keith Fritz. And today we have some really great segments in store. I know we always say that. Yes, but we, we do. We really do. Each week it just gets better and better. Well, it's because we really want our writers to excel at the craft. And, you know, natural talent is key, but without the knowledge, you really you need that extra help. So uh, we're going to be sharing some information and advice to help you guys to improve your writing. And advice is our next topic for this week's Writer's Absolutely. Reveal. We asked you to tell us one piece of advice you've been given that's helped you as a writer. And here's what a few of you guys had to say. I think one of the best pieces of advice that was given as far as being a writer is to keep reading because there's so many great books always being published and the more you the more you take in, the more you're going to be able to put out. Give an advice to say, write what you know. But I think what's more important is to write who you are. Stay true to yourself. Don't try to fit a market. Say, oh, I should write seriously because that's what they're buying or I should write more humor because that's what they're buying. You've got to be true to yourself and write who you are and what you know. The best piece of advice I was ever given was to just write every day. It's like training for a marathon. If you, if you take a couple days off, sometimes you get out of practice. The best piece of advice that I've been given as a writer is to write things that are important to me because it's really hard to fake what you care about. And if you try to, the writing doesn't ever sound good and your readers don't connect to it. So I try to focus on things that matter to me, things that make me happy, things that make me scared or angry, and create my books around those subjects. Well, what I would say is write the truth. The truth as you see it, the truth as you know it, and the truth as you've lived it. And that'll make a powerful piece right there. You know, those are some really great answers. I'm trying to, I'm just reminding me of all the great advice that I've received over the years. Uh, you know, in answering the question, it was hard to pick one, but it has to be dialogue. The first time I realized that I wasn't using it enough totally changed my writing. What about you? You know, some great advice that I've received, I've read a lot of different things, is always to remember who you are writing for, who's okay. your audience. So those are some good tips that we received in the back in the past. And we encourage you to go online and tell us what is one piece of advice you've been given that's helped you as a writer? While the debate on whether or not to outline rages on, you simply want to write a really great book, and you're looking for a method that's actually going to help you out. So why not try outlining? It even works for New York Times bestselling authors, including our next guest. Joining us is Lauren Grodstein. She teaches creative writing at Rutgers University, and her latest book is The Explanation for Everything. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Why don't we start right with why outline? Some I hear, we've, we've heard, say it stifles their creativity. So why outline? Well, I, I think it's really very useful to have a roadmap, especially when you're writing a novel, which is such an expansive document and can take years. So I don't know about you, but I can't remember what I did last week, much la less a few years ago. An outline gives me a sense of where I've been and where I'm going. So just for that reason alone, I really like to have one. On top of that, it gives me like a little bit of a to-do list. If I wake up in the morning and I get to my desk and I look at a blank piece of paper, it can sort of freak me out. But if right. I look at a piece of paper that says, you know, bullet point, this is what's going to happen next, I feel like, okay, now I can get started. Helps keep you mo moving Always. forward. Yeah, yes. so you just reminded me that might actually be an answer to a little bit of writer's block for some people. They're not sure where to go, but yes. if they've already mapped it out ahead of time, right. that's great. Right. Okay, how about different kinds of outlines? I know there's more than one style. Do you know one that's more common or do you think is maybe a little bit better than others? Well, the one that I, I mean, there are all sorts of outlines. I know uh, one famous and wonderful writer who tries to outline only the actions. So okay. it's action block by action block by action block. So no thinking, ruminating, backstory, none of that goes into the outline. Only I went here, I did this, I killed a man, I went to sleep, <laughs> that kind of thing. What I do is simply, you know, the, the big things that need to go on in a chapter 
whether or not it's backstory or characterization or even if I need to spend a few paragraphs detailing, say, the inside of a room, bullet po I have a bullet point outline system. It's sentences, and it's just sort of a rough guide. And then there are some who detail in their outlines almost to the sentence what's going to take place so that the outline almost operates as a draft. Um, I think it depends on every, you know, every author has to find the right styles. style. Yeah. yeah, right. So, so if you're a writer and you're starting, walk us through where should you where should you start? Wh what are the, you know, steps through? I, I need to sit down and write my outline. Where do you start with your outline? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is figure out what it is you want to write. You know, and and have some sense of who the characters are because a plot for in order for a plot to work, it really needs to stem from who the characters are. Um, a, a plot that, that doesn't relate at all to the characters feels really imposed and like the author doesn't even know what he or she is doing. She's just sort of giving a person something to do. Whereas what you need to do as a writer to make a, a cohesive plot is really think about who are these people and what would they do um, in the premise that you've set up. And then from there, so I take my people and then I start outlining, well, what would they do? And then I scan my outline and try to look, you know, for action that seems both necessary and engaging, and also sort of plausible considering who the people that I've created are. And, and with those people, do you ever further outline, say, their family history, well, a that, tree? Sure, that might happen in a different document mm -hmm. where I just sort of, you know, ramble on about character. And then a lot of writers write their way into characters so that the first two, three, four, even, you know, half a book sometimes turns out to be material that was written for the author as a way for the author to get into the character in the book. That stuff but it doesn't necessarily cut. make it into the sure. story itself. Right. Okay. Uh, what about some, I, I, I teach uh, middle school students, so they definitely deal with this all the time. They, it comes time to write a story and they don't know how, like these plot points, how yeah. to come up with them, where to, how to make the next decision for their story. Do yeah. you have any advice for any writers, young or otherwise, that might have that problem? Yeah, I mean, the, the solution I find to most of the world's problems, including this one, is to read more. Mm. I think that, which, you know, I'm sure all your middle school students are dying to hear, but um, I think that you know the best way to find out how a plot works and what what how life works is to read great fiction and so and there's lots of middle school great fiction just like there's great fiction sure. for all ages so um, that's my major advice and then the other thing I tell people is that if you want to be a writer it really helps to like people and to like people's behavior <laughs> I know I know you think that writers are these you know sort of misanthropic uh, meanies <laughs> yeah. but but we're not. I think you have to be interested in people. And if you know how people behave and you know the way people interact in different circumstances, it's often easy to build a plot around those interactions. I also right. think some of the greatest authors from all time are people that understood other human beings. And they just have an ability to put into words what the rest of us maybe notice and can't always articulate. Right. So that's great advice. Right. Now, there are a lot of scenes in books, right? right. So we've heard sometimes folks use spreadsheets. Do you recommend that? How do you sort of break down and, and go through a scene even, outline? I mean, I, I, if, if someone sends me an Excel document, I have no choice but to delete it. I don't know. <laughs> That's not, I, well. So, um, I, uh, you know, every author, depending on his or her needs and his or her own variation of, you know, compulsive right. behavior, will have the outline that works for him or her. Um, I like broad bullet points, and I like them to be flexible enough so that I can work things into them. You know, that they're, they're, they really are roadmaps, but they're not the entire road, and I can always go off if I need to. Um, but yeah, every author does what, what's comfortable for him or her. And there are some authors who really just find it fun to kind of just ramble on until they hit the moment where the story begins. They don't even use an outline until they're at a place where the story's starting. Right. So if you, I'm thinking, it sounds like if there's a good outlining ahead of time, then you have less revision work later. Ideally. Yeah. Ideally, but you never know, because sometimes, like, there's no such thing. There's no guarantee that your outline is the right outline. That's anyway, true. That's you true. You might have just outlined a really boring book. Or you may have just, you know, prevented yourself from having to do it two extra times. Right. So. Right. Uh, one final question for you. What about the kinds of mistakes and pitfalls that people who do outlining, you know, might make? Could you give them some advice to avoid doing some common mistakes? Well, I think that an outline often leads to research, um, which is a good thing, right? You you make an outline and you realize you need to know, in order for the scene to make sense, you need to know a lot more about, say, the Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. good. But then suddenly you've now given yourself license to spend the next three months researching the Mojave Desert and Got not it. writing your book. Yeah. So I think that with any pre-planning, I think it's wonderful to plan, I think it's wonderful to research, but it's not wonderful to use those things as a way to not do the hardest thing, mm -hmm. which is sit down in front of the blank page and write. 
So utilizing that outline as a guideline, keeping you on track, but not veering right. off so much Make that, it, right. I don't really need to do this. Yeah. 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 Just making sure that the outline doesn't become the project. Right. The yes, book is absolutely. the project. Okay. Well, I've certainly learned some more tips to enhance yes. my writing. I love outlining and love to-do lists, so this I'm is not, very I'm so helpful. surprised you like outlining. <laughs> So I need to do more outlines. So thank you very much for <laughs> Lauren, great thank ideas. you very oh, much for a joining pleasure. us. We appreciate that. Thanks for having me. We are the Princeton Writing Group, and we meet in several places around the region, but primarily we meet on Thursday nights at The Grind in Plainsboro from 7 to 9 p.m. To join the group, you go to meetup.com, create an account, and then opt to join the Princeton Writing Group. We have writers from many different genres and different styles. We have uh, primarily novelists, but we also have poets, playwrights, screenwriters. So it's open to whatever you work on. Most of our meetings are write-ins, which means that people come together, they bring their work, their individual projects, and we sit and write in one another's company. It's a great way to uh, be motivated, to make friendships, and just to make a time to dedicate to your work. Being the organizer is really rewarding because I get to see people take their projects from idea through completion. Uh, just a few weeks ago, somebody brought me a signed copy of his printed book, and that was just absolutely amazing. It's important for writers to join writing groups for many different reasons, but one of the ones that doesn't get talked about very much is that it confirms that you aren't crazy. You know, writers have these great ideas and they're always in our heads. We feel compelled to write about them. And unless you're around other writers with that same feeling, it can be very isolating. Uh, other people don't always get that. So being around these other people who have the same kind of ideas is very, very rewarding and very uh, validating. Stories with paranormal characters have exploded on the pages of books and on the big and small screen. Writings about vampires, psychics, witches, and other supernatural beings could be super fun, but there are some guidelines you should keep in mind. Absolutely. Here to offer some tips on getting it right when writing paranormal is E.F. Watkins. She's a journalist and author of several paranormal novels, including One Blood. Your name is Eileen. Is it okay if I call you yes, Eileen? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Um, one of the things that we need our viewers to understand right off the bat is a definition. We need to know what defines paranormal from other genres and even subgenres. Well, I think most people think of paranormal uh, as being, you know, something that seems uncanny, something that doesn't seem like it could happen in real life. Um, when you come down to things like psychics and people seeing ghosts, you know, that probably is more of a possibility, but I think that's, that's uh, how people define it. And as you okay. were saying before, uh, Jennifer, it's um, uh, certain characters also, you know, besides psychic phenomenon, when you get into uh, uh, vampires and werewolves and witches and demons and things like that, you know, you're, you're pretty much not in Kansas anymore. So. <laughs> right. Now, does any book with a, one or more characters with paranormal activity make that then a paranormal genre book? I would think so uh, by a lot of people's uh, standards, um, but, but I did read a definition online that said um, it's a paranormal book if you can't take the paranormal element out of it. Ah. In other words, if the, if, you know, the, the, the example they gave was, was uh, Dracula without Dracula, you know, is, is not, does not exist. And there are some people writing, for example, romances where I've, I've heard criticism of, you know, if the guy was human, it would be almost the same story. So That you know, doesn't right. really feel like it. But so, it should be really integral. Yes, to the story. Yeah. yes mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. What about the protagonist, your main character? Do you think that that character needs to have some kind of paranormal abilities, or can that person slide a little bit? Well, it kind of depends on the genre. Um, there's, there's a number of different things. I mean, if you have, have something like a horror novel, a lot of times the protagonist is, is human and is dealing okay, with some sure. kind of paranormal threat. Um, there's another genre that's only been around for you know, a little while called urban fantasy. Uh -huh. And I think that's kind of a weird term, but it, a lot of the characters in a book like that are paranormal. You may have, you have vampires versus humans. You have vampires, werewolves, and a, a number of other characters interacting with humans. It's almost like an alternate universe kind of thing. So um, you protagonist, and then again, if you've got somebody who's got psychic abilities, they may be human, but they do have that bit of paranormal twist. 
Okay, so it depends very much on that genre. But right, the subgenre. <laughs> yeah, subgenre. It also sounds we're kind of you know reemphasizing that idea of you know how much uh, in, how integral it is to the actual plot line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there some themes that the re you know the viewer the reader um, sees in, or expects, anticipates, um, and looks for in a character? Um, again, that really depends on the genre a lot. Um, I think, for example, in your typical vampire stories uh, lately, um, there has been, you know, the, the alienated vampire who, you know, has some redeeming social value, and uh, whether or not it's a romance, there's, there's a lot of sympathy for that kind of character. Um, urban fantasy has often involved... Um, the, the characters are kind of like symbolic of um, underclasses, of people who have been prejudiced against and that sort of thing. When you think of like Charlene Harris's um, uh, novels, which inspired the True Blood series, um, they're sort of parallels with, uh, um, you know, people who have been discriminated against in various ways. Um, that's a theme that people kind of look for, and it works pretty well in that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I know one of the other concerns that people who are trying to write paranormal and aren't so familiar with it is the the characteristics and how easy it is sometimes to overdo things and be mm -hmm. you know kind of take away the believability of it. Could you comment on that mm -hmm. a little bit for us? Yeah, um, I think there might be a temptation for some people to just say I can just make stuff up, you know, <laughs> and maybe okay. to do you know make it as wild as possible without any kind of of logic behind it. Um, I think, first of all, that the characters have to act somewhat human in the sense that you have to understand their motivations for doing things, even if they're coming from a different place than a normal human being. And then also, um, I think you've got to get the realistic stuff right. Um, for example, oh, yeah. in the, the book that you mentioned, One Blood, is actually set in Princeton, and I was somewhat familiar with Princeton, but I really researched it to make sure that the realistic stuff, you know, to get came the humans well. right. Get yeah. the, the setting, you know, the accuracy yeah. of it right and leave the fantasy stuff for just the fantasy elements of the it's story. It's like, like Stephen King created this, this, this very working class world to put oh, his yeah. monsters into and it made it was a tremendous success because people really believed it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so this could be a cliche question and the pun is intentional. But is there a way that a writer can make the themes not so cliche? Yeah, I think by, one thing that I think that people ought to do is not draw too much from TV and movies and other books, but primarily these days TV and movies, um, and think about what moves them, what frightens them, what interests them. I mean, there's a great opportunity in Paranormal to draw parallels with like real people, real experiences, and then just push it over the line a little bit. And I think that when you personalize it a little bit and really think about, you know, what scares you, what kind of people, you know, frighten you, um, you know, you, you'll you get something that's into, a little yeah. more individualized mm -hmm. and not so cliche. Are there some resources, places to go that um, the writer can utilize to learn more about paranormal, thriller, mystery? Well, first of all, I, there's a lot online. Um, I, some, some of the books that I used when I was starting out are almost a little bit obsolete now because they dealt with horror and there's so many other things mm. now. But um, you certainly can find a lot online. And I belong to two groups that I can mention that are both based in, meet in Middlesex County. And um, one is uh, started out as Garden State Horror Writers. Their, their um, website is still uh, gshw.net. Um, but they're actually calling themselves Garden State Speculative Fiction Writers now. So they're broadening yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And then there's another group, uh, Liberty State Fiction Writers, and that's Liberty States, plural, and you spell it all out, .com. And um, they meet in, in uh, Edison, and they have a number of people. They've kind of got a lot of romance writers, but they've got a lot of people who write um, paranormal romance among, among those. So those are two groups right here in our area. And, yeah, they meet in Edison, and uh, GS, GSSW meets in Old Bridge. Great. So, yeah, and you can find Thank them Thank you so much for Wonderful. coming in. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I enjoyed this. Wish we could Thanks. talk Thank more. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs>
Although you've worked hard to complete your manuscript, it can still be a struggle to get the attention of a publishing house. The majority of houses won't accept it unless it comes through a literary agent. But landing an agent and finding the right one for you also requires effort. Where should you put that effort? Well, here to share an insider's perspective is Wendy Sherman, owner of Wendy Sherman Associates Literary Management. Wendy, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Uh, one of the things that we would like to start with is this, the beginning process for the authors themselves, which is, of course, the submission guidelines. Uh, other than doing the obvious, which is to read them and follow them, is there something that authors could do to stand out? I think the best thing is to be very concise and to okay. lead with your lead and not bury something at the end of the query letter that maybe would have helped us to pay attention to it right from the start. Tell us what we really need to know to want to read more. So start with the most important thing. Exactly. Okay. What are some of the top mistakes that writers make when sending in a query? It's a great question. Uh, you know, there are a lot. Um, some of them are really obvious things like you know sending a query to a particular agent that's addressed to a different agent, so it's sort of, you know, you didn't do your homework, you weren't careful. Uh, the, the idea that you want to personalize something and if you're going to refer to a book of mine that I sold by a client of mine, don't mention someone I've never heard of because okay. it was probably intended for another agent and then that I know that. Good, yeah. Exactly. So I think it's important to be, you know, recognizing that you want to be selling one book. You may have three books that you think are worth getting published but I only want to hear about one, so you need to be the one to decide which is that one that we should take a look at. So this is maybe the second time I'm hearing we want to try to keep it streamlined. Streamlined. Go to the most important thing first and just one thing at a time. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know another big concern these days is authors and having a platform online. There are so many different options and so many ways. Is there a way that uh, you know, authors could maybe make sure that the agent knows where they're going with that? Well, I think, you know, if you have great numbers in terms of your social media following, if you mm -hmm. have great Twitter numbers or if you have a very strong Instagram or Facebook fans, I th you know, obviously you want to list that. But, I, you know, I, if you have a great platform, put it out there. If okay. you don't, it's not the end of the world. We don't expect every author to have a strong platform going out of the gate. Okay. Now, once you, you've been, con you know, contacted an agent, what are the steps that you should expect thereafter with the writer? What, what do they expect um, from you, that relationship? Uh, once we've actually signed a client, you mean? Yes. Well, at that point, we're really in it together. Then we're a team. It's a total collaboration. I want what's good for you is good for me. And I, I'm very careful to guide my clients in terms of what the next steps are with okay. re revision, getting a proposal in shape. I think we finished a sixth or seventh revision of a proposal over the weekend that will be going out to publishers next week. And at no point did this author say, I'm, I want to be done. I'm tired of revising. Mm -hmm. She just kept going back and making it sharper and better and being receptive to the comments that I was making, even to the point of being willing to change the title. Wow, that's so, actually a pretty big deal. It's a process. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes as long as it takes, and it's not ready until it's ready. Okay. So if the agent has uh, indicated that they're very interested in the, in the work and you've begun that relationship. I'm assuming there may have been a few times where the relationship went sour. Is there something, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, our show is for authors out there. Is there something you could advise them to avoid doing once you've established a good relationship? Yeah, I mean, there aren't too many cases like that, I'm happy to say. Okay. Once in a while, if we start working out together and sending the material out to publishers and we don't get a response right away, uh, sometimes people will say, maybe I'm just going to self-publish it. Mm. And they pull it back. And surprisingly, that, that disappoints me because I might be willing to keep trying and continue to try to find a place to, to yeah. put the manuscript. It doesn't have to be with one of the top five publishers. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really great publishers out there that are not the big five and that would probably do a better, better job with your particular book than one of the publishers that are only looking for bestsellers. Right. Plus, you've already invested your own time and energy. Exactly. You don't want to lose yeah. that yourself. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And sometimes we do recommend self-publishing or one of the hybrid publishers. Mm -hmm. And then it's not to get rid of the material. It's to really help you find a place to get it out there. Okay. 
Are there a lot of revisions that you see once you've, you've signed with, with a writer and you've got their manuscript? Now, are there a lot of revisions that you suggest? Do you do the revisions? Do you send them to someone else to do those revisions? Uh, all of the above. Okay. Sometimes we do an, sort of an overarching big picture edit and we suggest making changes. Okay. Um, if it still feels to me like it needs a more hands-on approach, something that's sort of beyond the purview of what the agency can provide, we work with many wonderful freelance editors who, I would say most of them at one point were employed by major publishers, but okay, for whatever reason are no longer working there. Sure. And they can be hired for a very reasonable price to get the manuscript in really polished, top polished shape. And if someone can afford to do that, it's really a worthwhile investment. I've because have heard many things about yeah, the importance of a good editor. It's really great because when we send it out to the actual editors at the publishing houses, they're expecting it to be pretty, uh, almost done. Yeah, you know, close. they're still going to edit close. it, yeah. but if an editor has to say to me, um, it needs a lot of work, they're That's probably never. not going to be making me an offer. Sure, so it's so much extra so, work for them. Yeah. Exactly. So your agency does maybe the first level of editing, mm -hmm. and if it needs a bit more work, then you recommend they go outside. Exactly. I mean, okay. would I love it if it came in perfect? Sure, well. <laughs> <laughs> as I would. <laughs> well, the other thing that happens is sometimes we'll send something out, and we'll send it to three or four editors who we work very closely with. And they'll come back and they'll make comments about it. And I'll go back to the author and say, you know, I'm hearing this from people. I'm hearing the same thing from three or four different very trusted senior level people. Yeah, that should I think bell. maybe we should step back and take another look at it. So the truth is, until it's sold, right. it's not done. And even when it's sold, it's not done. Right. <laughs> well, and before we go, what other ways uh, do you interact with a writer? Are there other things besides the editing process that you, you know, continue to work with a writer after you've signed them? Forever. I mean, it's a really a long-term, very deep relationship because we're involved in everything from, you know, preparing the material to selling it, negotiating the deal on the contract, mm -hmm. and you know, in, at, long after the book is published, we're still involved. So I mean, there's a this, lot of communication. Oh, before. yes. This week we've been sort of hashing it out with a publisher over a jacket design, over a, a book tour. Wow. You know, these things go on because the relationship is a, is a partnership between the sure. publisher, you know, the editor, and the agent and the writer. And every step of the way we all are involved in it. Yeah. So I think the idea that an agent makes a sale and then their job is over is completely incorrect. Yeah. I think it's very important for people to also realize that Agents are there to be the voice for the author. That's you know, very not, true. It's not somebody that authors are supposed to fight against, but they're supposed to be a team together. That's very true. Sometimes we have to be the good cop, and sometimes we have to be the bad cop. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming in. I know that some uh, people definitely learned some things. Oh, this good. has been very helpful. Great. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. Time. All right. Take care. If you're a writer, or hoping to be a writer, consider joining a writer's group. Here are a few in your area. The Princeton Public Library sponsors two writer groups, each one on alternative Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Formats include readings, feedback, and writer's prompts. Contact the library for more details. The Princeton Writers Group meets at many locations throughout central New Jersey on multiple nights of the week. It's an informal environment where you can come, bring your computer, and simply write, surrounded, of course, by other writers. Check out their meetup page at meetups.com. And the Plainsboro Writers Group meets monthly at the Plainsboro Library at 7 p.m. Writers may share prose, poetry, plays, commentaries, or other works. For more information on these and other writers groups, or to have your writers group listed, go to our website at writerstowriters.com. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. We'll see you next time for more Writers to Writers. <laughs>